All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for thanks for sticking around. Uh, we're in we're in a, we're in what we call a cluster session. We've clustered together these the, these speakers on the topic of synchronous versus asynchronous courses. Um, on, on the web page, it says the debate rages as though there's a there's a debate, and and as in most things uh, involved in law or legal education. Um, it's less of an either or and more of a continuum here, right? There are times when synchronous works, there are times when asynchronous works. Um, it, it should be interesting to, to learn from these folks. So uh, first up, we've got uh, Intersections Between Deliberate Online Pedagogy and Emergency Remote Learning uh, by Susan Landrum, uh, Assistant Dean for Academic Success at uh, Nova Southeastern, Shepherd Broad. Ellie Robbins, one of the Cali Academic Success, Law Success Fellows and Associate Professor of Law at CUNY School of Law. Melissa Hale, another Academic Success Fellow at the Director of Academic Success at, and Bar Programs at Loyola here in Chicago. Natalie Rodriguez, the Assistant Dean for Academic Success and Associate Professor of Law at Southwestern Law School. To be followed by Steve Friedland. I always forget. Do we do we pronounce you Friedland or Friedland? Friedland. Friedland. Professor. Uh, Either way it works, though. <laughs> I've been called worse. It's okay. I appreciate it. I'm 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 John Mayer, but all my life uh, I was called John Meyer, like the hot dog, um, until that rock star came along and told taught everybody the correct pronunciation of my name. Uh, anyhow, Steve's the professor and senior scholar at Elon University School of Law, and will be the last presentation will be synchronous or asynchronous lessons learned from teaching during COVID from Jennifer Martin, Cali board member and law professor at St. Thomas University School of Law. So let's start. Um, so as an introduction, as John mentioned, I'm Melissa Hale from Loyola. Um, I started teaching in an online format in 2018, which wasn't that long ago, but I was sort of thrown into the deep end because Loyola has a relatively new um, hybrid online weekend JD. So it's half online, half in person. We use Sakai as a teaching platform, Panopto for the asynchronous version of things, and Zoom for the synchronous when we can't be in the classroom. But until this semester, we were still in the classroom with them for the synchronous portion. And um, as John said, I'm, I'm Susan Landrum uh, from NOVA. And um, I've been teaching at least in a hybrid format for about 20 years, actually, um, and have worked with a variety of platforms. Currently, right now, um, I use Canvas as my learning management system and um, Panopto to do video, uh, and Zoom, of course, uh, for those um, synchronous uh, class sessions. My name is Allie Robbins. I'm from CUNY Law School. Uh, I've been doing a hybrid, so partially distance learning course for about two years. Uh, it, it is a pre-bar course that's six credits, um, and I use PowerPoint and do voiceovers to make videos, which I then upload to YouTube. I use TWEN as a course management system, um, and I've also used uh, TED-Ed and Edpuzzle to uh, add multiple choice questions to those videos. Hi everyone, I'm Natalie Rodriguez from Southwestern Law School. Uh, my experience prior to COVID really was with uh, delivering asynchronous content uh, to my students. I started about maybe four years ago using um, very low-tech narrated PowerPoints. Um, this past year, we moved uh, to using Canvas as the learning management system. So that's where all my asynchronous content is available for my students. Uh, to create the videos, I primarily use Camtasia for both uh, capturing videos and editing videos. And uh, for our synchronous um, the delivery this semester, we used Zoom. Okay, so with that, we're gonna get right uh, to our presentation. Um, so we'll start with uh, Susan. How has emergency remote teaching influenced uh, your choices for using asynchronous versus synchronous learning strategies? Um, I think for me, it's made me think even more intentionally than I have in the past about accessible design. Um, and, and, and thinking about, you know, I think when 
students want synchronous learning because it feels more like their their face to face classroom experience. And you do have the ability to see very quickly are students understanding you can adjust in the moment, things like that. But, but I really became even more conscious of how working in an asynchronous environment really enables me to ensure that my courses are fully accessible for all students with disabilities and and not just students for disabilities, but it, it's broadly accessible. Right. So one of the things we realized is people weren't prepared to be online. And so so sometimes it has to do with your Wi Fi access or who else is in the house with you at the same time or you know, other other types of things that may intersect with a student's ability to really fully access a synchronous classroom environment. Uh, and, and I think, you know, one of the things that we really need to think about is it's, it's one thing when somebody has intentionally gone into a program which is online or a course which is online and they knew that that's what they were signing up for and they plan for that and they have the resources they need to do that versus um, a situation like we've, we've just been in the midst of where uh, we're doing it on the fly and that means that people haven't had the opportunity to, to plan for it in a way that ensures full accessibility. Yeah, and I think another um, something that came out of this experience with going to remote teaching or emergency remote teaching synchronously, it really made me think about uh, just how intentional uh, I needed to be then for my uh, in-class exercises. Uh, I use the flipped classroom model. So uh, a lot of the uh, exercises that I have in class are collaborative and engaging. And uh, a lot of times I would just, you know, in the spur of the moment, add in one of those exercises into class because it just seemed to work based on the feedback I was getting from the students. Once we went into synchronous, I realized it's still possible to do that same kind of collaborative and engaging uh, exercises, but it just required so much more intentionality where I had to plan it out, I had to prep, I had to create um, and distribute the materials to the students ahead of time. Uh, one tool that I uh, discovered for the purpose of this, I'd used it many times in my own personal work, uh, but never with students, was using uh, Google Documents so that we could in real time collaborate together. Um, I was able to create uh, multiple Google Docs so that even if we were in breakout rooms, students could still continue to collaborate with each other. And there wasn't just one person who was engaged in the process of reporting uh, you know, the ideas or the information. And similarly for me, uh, it was really about thinking, what do my students absolutely need to get from me and what's the best platform to deliver that? Um, we also moved to Zoom and it was in the middle of this crisis that affected our students a great deal, right? We're in the heart of New York City and a lot of people uh, became sick and their, their loved ones became sick. And so they weren't gonna sit on Zoom with me for three hours like they would in uh, prior to COVID. And so I, I needed to think about what they absolutely needed and how, how I could deliver that and also about their lives. So where, where were they? What technology did they have? Um, how, how, were they, how distracted were they gonna be on Zoom? And, and as Susan said, thinking about their Wi-Fi connections and you know, their apartments they share with seven people, um, things like that, that really uh, came to light in a way that it, it didn't as much before. Um, and so that leads to our, to our second question, which is how do you approach asynchronous course design with intentionality? And I'll turn it over to Melissa. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, for asynchronous course design, I start with my learning objectives, which I think we do that for any teaching, really. But what are my learning objectives? And I go from there sort of moving backwards. I think about what needs to be done in a video or what can be done through an exercise or a handout. I think uh, many of us, I, I can only speak for myself, but I don't think I'm the only one, sort of get caught in a loop where you think of teaching as lecturing. And I think asynchronous course design helps us branch out and see what other tools we can use. Um, one big thing I found to be very helpful was scripting. I started teaching in 2006 and um, I was very opposed to using scripts for teaching because I found that it was very, um, I, I didn't want to be too um, stiff. And so I would use bullet points and things like that. And I found that for asynchronous videos, 
having a script was incredibly useful. It kept me more polished. And most importantly, as Susan would tell everybody, it's great for accessibility. Having that script really makes it easy to add in that level of um, closed captioning, which we really need to be doing for um, just for accessibility for students. Um, and it helped keep me on track and just, it, it, it's probably the best thing I've done with asynchronous. And I've started doing that with all of my teaching and kind of gotten away from the old habit of thinking that it would make me sound too um, stiff. Um, the other thing I decided to do with asynchronous to really help students kind of keep engagement, um, but also to be intentional about the teaching is Sakai allows you to have handouts near the video. So you can have the video option and then the handouts or downloads that go with that video. So whatever I had in my video, I would try to allow them to also be able to download, whether it was a PowerPoint or a Word document or a PDF, something so they could take notes on, something so they could have physically. Um, and I found that in incredibly helpful. So one of the things that I think I um, early on with my asynchronous experience just simply embraced is that there are challenges that come with asynchronous learning and that's okay. Um, you can usually uh, figure out a way to uh, capture or recreate those things that you usually would have done in the classroom but do so asynchronously. So for example, um, with videos, one of the challenges is I'm not there with my students when they're watching the videos. So I can't pick up on any of those uh, nonverbal cues I'd otherwise get from them during in-class lecture, letting me know that maybe there's confusion, um, that it would be a good idea for you to, uh, you know, to reteach a concept or provide an additional illustration to help them uh, fill that gap in understanding. And so there, there is a way around that though with the asynchronous videos and today's technology where you can embed questions. Um, so that's one way that I've um, I figured out a way to, to still get what I need from my students, which is their feedback, and for them to get what they need, which is, are they getting the information? Um, and so I use embedding, uh, I embed video, I'm sorry, I embed questions into my videos. Uh, another challenge with asynchronous learning is um, sometimes it can just feel less dynamic than it otherwise would feel if you're in class in person with your students. Uh, videos are delivered via flat screen. Um, and so with that, I, I, I've also tried to make up for some of that by including um, visuals in my videos. I try to find visuals that not only uh, help the students stay engaged and focus and, and keep their attention, but videos that are also helpful for learning. So for example, in one of my lessons where I'm covering uh, the difference between elements and factors to help illustrate in a different way rather than just hearing me say that, um, I use visuals such as a checklist to uh, really help them understand that when you're looking at elements, all of those have to be met. And then for factors, I use a visual of the um, scale of justice so that they understand the concept of balancing when you're using factors. Uh, so those are, th those are things that I think where they started as challenges and could have been, you know, maybe potential um, cons for that medium have really allowed me to enhance my teaching by just simply embracing them and trying to figure out other ways to still get um, what I need and deliver to my students what they need for, for my class. Yeah, and I think for, for me, you know, I, I think our theme is intentionality to a lot of the things that we're talking about. Um, you know, for me, intentionality also involves really thinking about the, how I'm using the learning management system. Uh, right now, I'm using Canvas. It could be, you know, Blackboard or Sakai or, or Twin even. Um, I, I tend to treat it, what, what I want it to look like as a website. I want it to look really accessible and clean. And, and um, I want to create narrative that carries the student through the lessons um, that I'm presenting and the content um, and make very visible to them what they should be doing with the things that I've loaded into the platform um, and, and make sure that, you know, that they know how to accomplish the objectives um, that, you, um, that you are trying to accomplish with any particular lesson.
We have lost Allie. We've lost Allie. We, you're not muted, but we can't hear you. We can see you talking. Right, try unplugging and replugging in your uh, your headset. Nope. Yep. Well, let me let me jump on then. I I think we've just got a few more minutes for right now, um, and so um, maybe we we jump into our, our last question quickly, um, uh, which is looking at, you know, what are the, the differences between approaching synchronous teaching online versus synchronous teaching face-to-face? Um, -face? Uh, and can we still be interactive and engaging and collaborative in that online synchronous environment? So for me, I had already been using a flipped classroom model with the hybrid design, ensuring that everything, um, John shaking his head. No, you keep talking. I'm trying to talk oh. to Allie. Okay. <laughs> um, this is know, kind of I, funny, right? I, <laughs> um, already been using the flipped classroom with our hybrid design to keep everything that was sort of substantive and lesson orientated um, in video and on the Sakai, which is a learning platform. Um, I know we had a question about that. The struggle was I was used to having my in-person classroom for things like parent shares and discussions and self-grading. And I'm still kind of struggling with how to um, make that as engaging on Zoom or in other platforms and have started playing out with polling, with breakout rooms. And I'm going to turn it over to Natalie because I think she's had some more success with that engagement part. Um, where I'm still learning. Let me steal one second. Allie, try unmuting. Yeah, I think my there you go. Back, right? Sorry. Yes, it is. Well, we should keep, you should keep going. Go ahead, Natalie. Okay, so um, with, with uh, the synchronous portion, I, I think, again, keeping with our theme, intentionality goes a long way. So to give you an example, um, polling. We're all pretty now familiar with Zoom polling, and that's easy to use, and that's great, and that's better than nothing. Uh, but with just a couple of additional uh, uh, steps ahead of time, you can take one simple exercise and get so much out of it. So, for example, if you were to have your students register for your virtual classroom ahead of time, that will give you the ability to go into the Zoom web portal after the meeting and pull a report that shows you how your students answered the questions. So you went from giving them an opportunity to anonymously respond um, so that they're engaged and, and you can get a feel for how the class is doing to now have an opportunity to actually intervene with individual students if it's apparent to you that they really, they're really they not getting the material the, the, rest, um, the way the rest of the class is getting it. Um, another way that you can enhance that same polling feature is when you create your registration on the web portal you can add custom questions. So you can take, again, an, an activity as simple as polling and use it for grouping the students into groups where, sh where they share um, similar um, hobbies or interests or whatever it might be so that you can really facilitate a sense of community and belonging in your classroom. Um, so that's the kind of intentionality that I think about when I'm thinking through my exercise exercises is how can I get more out of any one of my exercises so I'm maximizing the time that our student that I'm spending with my students in class because like Melissa I, I use the flipped classroom model and so that in class portion is really where I get to see my students understand where they are and they get to uh, interact with the material. Very yeah. good. Yeah I was going to say um, the, having left Ali out could we give her a moment to, to jump uh in? I was going to suggest exactly that. Ali, your, your last words on, on, this, on this segment. Yeah, my apologies for that. One of the things I was going to say about planning for the synchronous component online is that you need to also plan for tech glitches, right? So sharing the screen is going to take a while. Sometimes it's going to mess, get messed up. Sometimes people aren't going to have sound. They're going to get kicked out. And you've got to build in time for all of that. Time is really different online than when you're in class with somebody. Attention spans are different. Uh, it takes longer to kind of get people situated into, okay, let's do this activity now. Um, so you really need to be intentional about adding some time to what you think you would do if you were in person. Um, and then, then the other piece uh, is really being intentional about the student piece of it too. If you're doing things asynchronously, you want to make sure that you're giving students time 
expectations, right? I'm expecting you to spend about this much time on this activity. Here's my suggestion for the order in which you do these or how you go about using these platforms because we don't wanna just assume that they're comfortable with it, that they know that they have an idea. Um, they're getting comfortable with it as, as we are. And so I think we need to be intentional from the student side as well and give them much more direction than you think you need to. Um, and if some of them don't need it, then they don't need it. But I think that, that most of them seem to, to really appreciate that. Um, and really, you know, again, time is different. You want to have shorter interactive activities, um, whereas you might be able to do more uh, longer activities in, in person. So thank you all. Thanks. It's almost as though the, our brains are different when they're online versus when they're in the classroom. I wish we had somebody who could talk about the neuroscience. Oh, we do. Our next session, our next speaker is uh, Steve uh, Freeland, who's going to talk about the, the neuroscience of, uh, of this all. So Steve, uh, why don't you take it away? Okay, great. Thank you, uh, John. And thank you to that first session, which is terrific. Uh, I'm Steve Friedland from Elon, and I'm going to talk about online learning and neuroscience. And I'm going to probably come down on both sides of asynchronous and synchronous. And I'm going to uh, see if I can overcome what Ali said and share my screen uh, so we can do a slideshow here and talk about um, neuroscience and online learning. Working. Okay. We are good, okay. So it came up, that's good. And um, I'm not seeing it, unfortunately. It's on your second screen. Is it right here? Okay, let's know, see if this works. But we're gonna talk about... Um, there we are, slideshow. Okay. From start. Great, okay, we made it through. See Ali, even us old people can sometimes get things right after a little fumbling. But um, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I've done some research and I've worked with an Elon neuroscientist named Amy Overman, who's terrific. And so she wants to bring her neuroscience to different places. And I taught for a long time at a bunch of different law schools. And always my teaching was, I think it's good, but I don't really know. I mean, I get an evaluation at the end of the year, but who knows what they're learning? And that's the real question. It's not what I'm saying. It's what they're getting. So that got me on this road. And I just have really one goal in the next 15 minutes to show how neuroscience and really educational neuroscience which is a combination of cognitive science, neuroscience, psychology, and educational theory, and how that can help us online. So what's the problem? We already know it. It's fatigue from being online. It's really distracting. Uh, motivation is really tough. And of course, can we remember it when it's done? It reminds me of uh, graduation speeches. It's kind of like the same thing as John said, time is different. So let's go and look and see how this really um, applies because it is different when you look at um, the conscious mind versus the unconscious mind. And the conscious mind is not a calculator. It is actually slow, effortful, and uncertain. And when I heard that, it was voila, that's why law school is so tough. And that's why leaving class, it's mental aerobics. So that's one thing to really understand the unconscious mind is what we use all the time. We are instinctive. And this comes up in current times too, especially with bias. We can say we're not biased, but most of what we do is unconscious. How come? It's fast. It's effortless. And what I've uh, read about from the neuroscientists is that our minds are pattern-seeking devices. That is, we want to see a pattern and then we just jump. We see a group, we categorize. What's the problem? our unconscious mind is often wrong. So here, let me give you a problem that was given to lots of Ivy Leaguers. And it's a straightforward problem. A bat and a ball cost $1.10. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? I wish I had those sound effects. I can put a drum roll or something here, but the quick response is gonna be bats a dollar Ball is 10 cents, but that's wrong. That only answers point one. The bat has to cost a dollar more than the ball, which requires more thought. So the 
bat actually costs a dollar five and the ball five cents. That's that conscious mind, which we short circuit all the time. And that I think is one of the problems we're gonna see with online learning, but all the stuff I'm talking about can be applied to the regular classroom as well. So how do we deal with this problem of fatigue? And actually the experts say, we need to use lots of breaks. And how long? Actually, Pomodoro, it's 30 to 40 minutes. So that's changed my whole analysis of classes. I usually teach two hours at a time, but now I wanna to try to break it up into segments because fatigue is setting in. And actually, I would even say, that's why I'm glad this is only 15 minutes, how long do people uh, listen until they tune out? And the answer is about eight to 10 minutes. So I'm gonna lose some people even before we're done. And ironically, um, stretching, physical activity, recovering is really good. Edison used to take naps sleeping up at lunchtime with ball bearings. And he'd fall asleep, but as he fell asleep, the bearings would fall and wake him up. How come? It's not focusing all the time that answers problems. I don't know about you, but sometimes when you're taking a walk, you're in the shower, you're just looking at the sky, it comes together because our brain circuitry is actually much broader. That's diffuse thinking. So taking breaks is actually good for learning, just like sleeping. And I would even go further. We, our unconscious minds, we need to use them. And believe it or not, I love this study. They showed someone happy faces and they showed other people frowning faces. Who learned more? Well, we can already guess that answer. That unconscious conditioning will help us learn more if the screen shows that nice dog and cat, no, they're not my pets, although I can tell you in the fall, I am gonna do something with pets and or a nice picture and ask students to bring them in because that's gonna help them, believe it or not, it primes them for learning. It's not just the facts, which is what we often used to consider law school, that it was just thinking like a lawyer. We forgot that feeling part, and I'm gonna really emphasize that in a minute or two, that can really help learning. And that's really what I'm focusing on here. How do we promote learning? Um, so how do we do that and not be distracted? Well, distraction, in order to learn, you have to pay attention. And distraction happens all the time. And of course, the real question is we always pay attention but to what? And it actually is what we value. So if you're taking a walk and you're a bird watcher, you're gonna look at the birds. But if you're a jogger, you won't see any birds. And you might not even see anything but the ground in front of you. And I love this, we already know this already. Multitasking is just doing lots of things poorly at the same time. So I talk about paying attention, don't look at the screen, how many tacks were up there and what colors were they? Well, unless you're interested in tax, you probably are not looking at those, or if I ask you to draw it afterwards, this is what happens in our brain. And actually, when we are learning, our brain is changing. The neurons are actually growing and changing. They connect up to 10,000 different ways with one piece of information. So what we really want to do is watch what we're focusing on. And I'm actually going to talk to students and have been about all this neuroscience, because what's the goal? To make them better self-regulated learners. How do we do this? I think the neuroscience is really telling us what's a good way to do it and what's not so good. And I don't know about you, but I did everything really poorly in law school, now that I look back at it. Crammer, skimmer, I can go on and on. Okay, but I won't go on and on with 15 minutes. Okay, our brain. Inputs are coming at us all the time. But here's the interesting thing, our working memory only will stop eight or nine things at a time, according to the neuroscientist. So if I gave you a number and it's nine digits, we're probably gonna forget it. So that's why it's important to chunk things. We just sort of discard a lot of things, eight or nine. To get into long-term memory, we have to really pay attention a lot of times. And here's why, I don't know about you, some days I'll drive home and I'll get in my parking uh, garage and I'll say, how did I get here? I hope I didn't hit anyone. I think I stopped at the light. That's because we've done it so many times, they call it muscle memory, right? It's so ingrained, we can be distracted and let our unconscious minds take over. But think about it, the students are getting this for the first time. That is not gonna make it to long-term memory where storage strength and retrieval matter 
it may not even make it to working memory. That's why at the end of class, I now understand a student comes up to me and says, professor, can you explain this? And I'm thinking, I did in the class. Once through is not enough. And that's something I think all of us in law really needs to, need to consider. Okay, so how do we deal with this problem? And this actually goes to our first session. I'm gonna suggest our regular frame of the class is the top of the pyramid is a, not a good frame, especially for online learning. I think we need to reframe things as mobile learning. And that means that pre-class is just as important as class, just as important as post-class. And I actually think we should front load according to the neuroscientists by saying, here's how we want you to read. Here are problems you wanna do in advance. That actually primes the brain for what's coming and gives them questions in advance, videos in advance. Hey, what are your questions in advance? Physicists, physics professors have come up with something called just-in-time teaching. Before a class, they'll actually give a quiz to find out what their students know or don't know. So they can emphasize the important points in class. It's called just-in-time teaching. So that's a great thing we can use where a lot of the work is done before class and classes to go through the tougher stuff, the thorny problems. And then I think one of the big things is, already I've been talking way too long, and if this was a class, I would have said, okay, everybody, write out your questions. Or here's my question about the bat and the ball. How would you approach it? Post it online or in the chat. So everyone is doing something on a regular basis. Or these five people, you take this perspective of the defense, you take this perspective of the prosecution. I teach criminal law, among other things. Or I might say at the end of class today, go out and find an easement, take a picture of it, find it online and post it. Or do an interview with somebody or pair share in groups. So this is a way to engage students where it's not our linearity that we use in law school so much. Okay, motivation. I love in Goodwill Hunting, he went and became a janitor at MIT, going across the river. How come? He was motivated to see if he can compete. And in neuroscience, one of the things that they learned, this is all in the last 10 to 15 years, they're really learning an amazing amount. Emotion and cognition are partners. We have multi layers working at the same time. We don't have just one part of the brain that goes for a certain task. It's usually the cortex and the subcortical components like the limbic system, which is where the emotional parts come from, work together. That's a huge um, understanding because law school is not just about thinking like a lawyer. It's also acting like one and feeling like one. Think about it. We've ignored the feeling part and many of our students, the studies show it's about eight to 10% of the students who come into press. 40% or so leave the press. We're not doing something right. And I think with online especially, I'm gonna really emphasize well-being is critical for us and for them. It's really well-being first, second, and third, or else the learning process is gonna be hurt. So what can we do? Use emotion. Um, one thing that I've gotten into is taking uh, gratitude breaks. What are we grateful for? And having students talk about that. One student taught me, hey, we should do a pay it forward on a Friday. What kind of act of kindness are we gonna do? This sets the stage so they can really get into the learning process and look forward to coming to a class. Uh, I think creating settled expectations in the COVID era is critical. And a settled expectation that we might have to switch at a later time. So I think we wanna tell them, here is what we anticipate. And tell them that a bunch of times and not ignore it and just leave it be because they want information. Uh, there's enough anxiety for all of us right now. And I think curiosity, according to the neuroscientists, that's open. Judging is closed. So being curious about things is just another way to do it. And so how can we do a lot of these things too? Narrative, storytelling. Stories are a great way to learn and actually people will learn better and with emotion. So if I asked you what your memories were when you were age six, it's probably gonna be emotional ones, maybe a birthday, maybe something really significant that happened. And in any year, we remember emotional memories. So to get things in long-term memory, emotion really can help. Okay, so competition. 
the brain actually has a dopamine uh, release center where when you're competing and you get something correct, it actually releases more dopamine. So I love using multiple choice questions just to get draw in students who are not really involved to see if they can get the right answer. And this question when I'm teaching constitutional law is a good one to ask that just is not directly related to Korematsu or Hirabayashi or Endo, but which statement is the most accurate? And D is the most accurate statement. And that gets them thinking and gets them more emotionally involved. The other statements are partially true. Two relocation centers were on Indian reservations. That allows me to talk about that. And there were 27,000 children under the age of 10. And 2,000 people from South America were brought into camps. But this allows me to do this instead of me lecturing. It has them involved and motivates them. Similarly, context really is important to learning, according to all of the experts. So here's another question. Um, involving uh, slavery. And if I'm teaching con law, I am talking about slavery. And people may be surprised that D is the best answer choice here as well. But 12.5 million people were taken forcibly against their will from Africa. Most weren't taken directly to North America, South America, and the Caribbean were the first stops. And only 10.7 million survived. 1.8 million people died along the way. So I can really use this as context. The chess expert knows a lot about context. And that's where we are as teachers. Our students are only getting a thin amount. We want to give them more. That's the whole point. OK, so long-term learning. Our brain is not a computer, and we need to repeat a lot. And it's based on um, all the learning they've done before. So a lot of our students coming in are not at the same level. We need to understand that. So now I love having pretests. And the second thing that I draw on the board all the time is this, the forgetting curve. Herman Ebbinghaus, 1885, looked at this and said, how quickly does memory dissipate? Holy moly. By the end of class, 20 minutes, they're losing almost 40%. By nine hours, they only have about 30% left. So already, if they're doing outlines at the end of the semester, forget about it. They shouldn't even do it probably at the end of the week. That's probably too long. So after class is a big time for us to reinforce and go over things. And this is important online. Just spoke to a friend from American University, Steve Ormiel, a great guy and a great teacher. He spends up to 45 minutes after classes. I think that's great for students just to hang around to get some real information after a class is over. We think class is over, done, and let's wait for office hours. I think that's a mistake. Okay, so which of these are the better ways to learn? And I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna be quick. The first ones of these are the best three ways according to the learning experts. Space repetition, quizzing, I like it now all the time, and interleave, meaning multiple things, really comparing and contrasting. So if I'm teaching criminal law, can you compare and contrast the different types of homicide? Or if I'm teaching property, what's an easement versus a restrictive covenant? If they can't compare, they don't really know it. So how do we do it in a class? I now love us breaking up a class in a different way. At the beginning of a class, what did we do last time? That's already gone. For space repetition, I wanna talk about what happened before maybe where we're going. And here's another thing. I don't know about you, but I now realize a lot of our students take things down, not in a great way. And that stays all the way through the exam. So in the middle of class, I'm going to stop and say, note break, what was the most important thing that happened? Based on the neuroscience, they're already forgetting it. Now they get to reinforce it, but also see if they're on the right track. And last but not least, at the end of a class, hey, what'd you get from this class? What's fuzzy and why? And I'm gonna to talk to all the people who are out there now and spend 10 seconds. What's one thing you might take away? Okay, and you can humor me. If there's nothing, make something up. Well, this silence might've been the most important part of what we've done because you're thinking backwards and trying to recapture something that otherwise is moving on past. So one last thing. The brain creates lots of schemas, pictures, 
So when I teach evidence, here's my whole course pretty much. It's right here. I'm gonna give it to them at the beginning. They do that in bar review and students ask all the time, why don't we do that in law school? The neuroscientists are gonna say, we should do this in law school. When I'm teaching crim, uh, excuse me, con law, here's the big house of due process. There's five different doctrines, at least as I look at it within the house, put them in the different places. It's a good way to remember it. So what do we do today? We did four things. I'm gonna do what the neuroscientists say. Say what you're gonna say. Here's what we did about fatigue, distraction, motivation, and long-term learning. So I leave you with this, a little Ralph Waldo Emerson. Every day is a new day, right? Even in online teaching, and if that doesn't do it for you, there's always P. Diddy. Can't nobody get me down. Oh, no. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Thanks, Steve. Oh, good, and you unshared your screen. So our last speaker is Jennifer Martin. Jennifer? I suppose I'm supposed to play a video now, is that right? Yeah, I, I was gonna play the video that I already recorded, um, although I'm here to talk about it afterwards, because um, I'm a few weeks down the road from what I recorded. And so it's interesting in terms of what I've since learned from what I thought I learned before. But it, do you have the video? I'm all set to play it. Okay. Let's uh, share, share and optimize and go. Hi, I'm Professor Jennifer Martin of St. Thomas University School of Law. Oops, there we go. <laughs> I'm going to talk today a little bit about synchronous or asynchronous and lessons, at least those learned by me, from teaching during COVID. So um, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I've done this spring and then what I'm um, going to be doing this summer. So spring 2020, um, I was teaching uh, secured transactions and payment systems. And then I had a um, small group of students who were working on appellate briefs uh, for an amicus initiative. So I did my classes through Zoom with students online with me at, in real time in a synchronous class. So I tried to somewhat approximate what I do in the real classroom as much as I could. Now this of course was a transition in the middle of the semester. Um, and so maybe I've learned a lot. So I started out, um, I, would, I did PowerPoints and I made sure that I had a PowerPoint for every class. Um, but um, in class normally, I would often uh, be looking at web pages um, like this one on Article 9. So I did the same in that respect that I might have in class. Now I didn't use a whiteboard per se, um, but uh, to the extent I wanted to uh, highlight something, I would just get out the pen and write on the screen. Um, and whether, um, or to the extent I was doing a hyp hypothetical, I would type it in you know, hypo uh, one, you know, a, uh, you know, takes out a loan from, B, from B, and then I would go ahead and do the, the hypothetical right there um, on the screen. Um, but I did it directly either on my screen, if I was on a web page, or perhaps I would do it on the PowerPoint uh, directly. So I used for questions, students could raise their hand and, and ask a question, or sometimes they would just interrupt. Um, I, some students would also use the chat feature for, for their questions. Um, I often, I, so one of the things I sometimes worry about with an online world is student engagement. So I often would begin my classes with a multiple choice question and they would use Kelly's Insta poll uh, and answer the question. I would put the question up, they would have a number of minutes to answer it and then record their answer in uh, Insta poll. And then I would call on a student um, and lead discussion about the problem in, in that manner. So uh, for this class, PowerPoints, uh, web pages, chat feature, Insta poll, diagrams in real time, and then I would record the, um, the session and put it in my twin classroom. 
So I did use Cali Lesson Link also in order to allow the students to do Cali lessons. And I did, uh, um, for these classes, I had them doing them as extra credit. Um, I also had other writing assignments and the like that they could work through twin. Um, but I guess for me, in terms of Cali products, I was using the Instapol and then the lesson links themselves. So um, for office hours, um, I did, uh, I guess, live discussion forums through TWEN where I would tell the students, I will be in the live discussion on Tuesday from nine to noon um, and I will answer questions. Now doing questions in this manner means the students would have to type their answers and I would respond by typing my response. So there's a limit to um, what you can do with the students um, in that type of, of discussion forum, but the um, transcripts would be recorded for other students uh, to review. I'm not sure that the students, the other students actually reviewed those. Um, so um, I also did um, office hours through Zoom. So, but I, I generally did those if there were three or four students who had questions, I would go ahead and set up um, Zoom office hours and send the link out to the whole class. So anybody who wanted to appear um, for the Q&A could, and then I would record it. Typically for those sessions, I might have as many as six to 10 students who would appear um, and engage. So this was all done, you know, somewhat in real time, whether it was, you know, appearing for class, whether it was, um, we're going to do the live discussion uh, point at this point in time, or we're going to all meet for a Zoom office hours. The only asynchronous that I did for spring um, was I did record uh, uh, review sessions for each of my classes, and those were done with just uh, me speaking to a PowerPoint um, for two hours uh, without the Q and without any Q and A. So it was just a pure video, or I get or I guess audio as well, and then they had the PowerPoint for that. So. What were some of the challenges in working uh, with this? Well, you know, obviously even taking attendance, I just had the students um, mark their attendance in the chat box. Um, but this went from being a, um, an in-person class to an online class. I had students um, that had internet problems. Uh, there were too many people trying to be on the internet at their house. So being able to do a full video wasn't possible for them. I had another student who, I guess there was construction in her neighborhood, so she couldn't actually vocally appear because it would be really, really noisy. Um, I had other students that did not have microphones. They didn't have video, um, which might sound surprising in this world, but not everyone has the same type of tech. So spring classes, primarily synchronous with a little bit of asynchronous uh, portion to it. Um, and I tried to make a lot of attempts to still call on people and engage uh, students as much as I could. And they, and they did fine on their final exams, which they did um, the multiple choice question through TWEN. And then they had an essay for 24 hours that they was emailed through the registrar's office. So I found um, transitioning something in the middle of the semester is not the same as trying to plan for it. So this summer I'm teaching business associations, which is a four credit course and contracting in a crisis, which is a one credit skills course. Um, and I've decided since I knew these courses were going to be online, I wanted to plan a synchronous and an asynchronous portion to each of these courses. Um, one of the most difficult things that I found is how do you balance the in-class assignments and the out of and the out of class time? And what what drug me down is this required a lot of planning, and it's also requiring a lot of prep work for me, which I'm still buried in. So I have taught business associations as a summer class before. Um, it's four credits. You meet for four hours. I show up. We we chat. We do, I do PowerPoints and the like, and we go through the code. So um, I decided it's difficult to get the students um, engaged. I did tell them that the course would have um, both 
portions, um, asynchronous and synchronous. Um, and that part of their grade was going to be for the final examination, part would be a midterm, and then part would be through um, class assignments. Um, so for summer, I'm still going to do the uh, live discussions. I've also got a twin discussion forum going that's not live, and I'll still do the uh, Zoom office hours if, if I've got groups. So the, the biggest thing to plan is I decided that to try a roughly 50-50 split on my in-class time versus the students on their own or uh, on their own learning. And so I set up the syllabus um, to take that into account um, by topic, assigned readings, and then online assignments. So this course would have normally been scheduled to meet from nine in the morning to one in the afternoon, twice a week. And now they're going to be meeting, um, it, it, instead, they're going to be meeting, um, I guess, half that. I'm hoping I'll meet from 9 to 11, but we'll see since I haven't quite started yet. So what I did for this course is I'm creating some new content. Um, I did, uh, I've already recorded some of the, these videos. I did a video on introduction to business forms, and I did another video on agency law. And so that's part of the on their own portion of what they'll do for the first class session. And then to make sure they're actually watching these, they, um, I have a twin classroom and they have to do certifications that they've watched the videos in their entirety. So each video is an assignment in twin and they have to do a certification for each one. So in terms of Yes, I can certify that they've learned something, but I'm always worried about one's mind being engaged. Um, and so I'm also using Callie's lesson link. So they have a lesson link for this course where um, I've, I've put a whole bunch of Callie lessons that I plan that they're gonna do. And so for instance, for the first uh, day of class, they're supposed to work the Callie lesson on authority, actual and apparent, and then liability to agents, um, of agents to third parties. And so I require, I give them as many um, options to work those lessons as they want, but they have to earn at least a 75% in order to get um, the points. It's a very small amount of points, um, but my suspicion is they will do the Cali lessons because they'll want to get the, the points um, earned for the course. Uh, and of course, they have to work this through the um, Cali lesson. Now doing the, the, so that's part of their on, 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 on their own learning. And so basically most of my video content is somewhere between 30 minutes to an hour in length. And so they may have one or two videos uh, on a weekly basis. And then um, I'm also supplementing with some Cali lessons. And so I tried to balance what they're doing on their own with what I expect they'll do in the class sessions. So when they come to class, I'll answer questions about things they learned from the videos. And then we will discuss, I guess, material that uh, wasn't in the videos, uh, things that are still remaining, for instance. So this is, this is requiring me to record videos and I have recorded about five new videos of content um, and I still have maybe eight more to work on. So this is um, laborious in order of to, if you're gonna create brand new content. Um, so not all my content is brand new. And so one of the things that they are doing is um, I'm requiring the students to get a, a free ABA Business Law Section membership. And so um, there is some good content created by others that I'm including as part of the course. And so uh, one of those happens to be um, a uh, program that the ABA has on Enron to Volkswagen, the importance of governance, culture, compliance, and ethics. And so they will do this program and then we'll come to class and uh, talk about the substance of ethics and the decisions that those who govern uh, corporations actually make. And so, um, you know, sometimes I guess um, I could have students come to class and we could watch a video. Now we have a lot of the, um, con some content that might either be lectured on or that could be lectured on or content by others, that's actually now things that they, the students are going to engage in um, on their own. And of course, it's backstopped, backstopped with um, Cali lesson link.
So, um, so I guess there's, uh, in, in this, a lot of new uh, recordings of video content by me using some video from other sources. I'll still have, when we do meet in, in class, I'll use some of the techniques that I've used in the past with the students. Um, and then I'm using Twen as a portal to have all this content put together. So the students will be doing their certifications. Um, those are set up as assignments through TWIN. Um, their Cali lesson link is, is separate. They'll do their um, midterm through, uh, through TWIN as well. And then of course the course videos and the course um, PowerPoints uh, will all be in their, in their TWIN classroom. And so this course, hopefully we'll see, will be about half and half and I'm hoping the students will still have a good experience um, and that some of the students that had some of the challenges with their technology, I'm hoping that by the time summer rolls around, some of that will be cured. I did ask them all to make sure that they have both a, both a, um, uh, a camera as well as uh, a microphone available for the summer course because I do plan on trying to engage people in discussions on the material that remains for the two hours that we um, of, of the class sessions that we'll be actually um, be participating in together. So this is what I've done in the spring from the spring and this is what I'm planning for summer. I think it's a big challenge to go ahead and um, uh, create new content if you want to do um, something asynchronous if you don't already have a base base of content out there. Um, but I thought I could probably uh, use some of the content in other ways, um, even if I wasn't teaching an online class. So I don't know if this has given you any ideas for your own teaching. Um, but I'm enjoying uh, doing some of the new stuff and I look forward to talking to people um, about online teaching. Wow, that was fantastic. Go ahead. I say, are, are, is there any time for, for q and A? I saw there's a lot of, a lot of questions because this is something I think we're all thinking about. So no, there's no time whatsoever. Bye, everybody. No, just kidding. Yes, there, there's 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 lots of uh, great questions in the in the Q and A, and um, I'm gonna uh, call an audible and say let, we're gonna take ten minutes and 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 answer some of these questions. Um, happy hour can wait, and I'll duck. <laughs> um, all right, let's start right at the top because the Q and A does a thing. Um, here, um, uh, an anonymous attendee has said, "Our dean has told us that the ABA is discouraging." asynchronous teaching. There's not enough student faculty interaction. How are you meeting the ABA requirements on student faculty interaction? Who wants to jump into that breach? I'll jump, I'll jump in immediately. Um, you know, I, I think there's a real misconception about what asynchronous education is. Um, I, I think, if anything, I have more interaction with students in the asynchronous classroom. Um, because, you know, I, I do a lot with students that's involved in, in a discussion type format um, and when it's asynchronous um, and it, I'm not just putting them in a space where they're talking, I'm engaging with that as well, right? So, so um, I think, you know, there's, there are those types of opportunities. You make yourself very accessible to students. Um, you set you set expectations with students about what that accessibility is, how it is, when it is, things like that, um, to, to continue engaging with students. Um, but engagement comes in all kinds of forms as well, right? So if you're doing um, some sort of formative assessment within an asynchronous model, you're engaging with them if you're giving them feedback on it as well. Um, and, and so, you know, I think, I think we, we have to get away from this idea that we have to be face to face, that I have to see your face in order for us to be actually interacting with each other. I agree. Anybody want to uh, um, add to that? I'll just, I'll just say I would, I, I would worry if I didn't talk to my students that I would have some that I would lose because they're, you know, you know, maybe I've got students who are ADHD and all kinds of people with different learning challenges. Um, and so I always um, am concerned about, uh, about that level of engagement. 
But something that Steve said really resonates, this idea of breaking material into parts. So if they spend just 20 or 30 minutes um, on a video, I've probably already lost him halfway through, he's gonna tell me, but it's better. Imagine my a four hour Zoom session with me. I don't care how much caffeine I drink, but that's a long time to have four hours of business associations live um, it, when, you're, when you're at a distance. And so I actually decided it was an improvement to go ahead and chunk the material such that, hey, the students are going to watch this little video on this. They've got to watch this other little video. They're going to go do some, they're going to engage with uh, through um, the Cali lesson link on this. And then we're going to all get together. We're going to talk about it. And I think it, um, maybe it was Steve that mentioned this as well. I stay, I have my two hour session, but I stay afterwards for as long as people want to, in my Zoom session, want to talk about uh, business associations or they have other questions, everything from the, their tech to the substance of what we've been discussing. So I think you really have to make the effort to engage with them uh, because surely it's different. And for first years in particular, I, I hope we can be um, live in the fall when I get my contract students. Um, but I surely made it work, making it work. Would I like to have my BA students in, in person? Sure. Um, but, I, but I think they're enjoying the class. And if I could maybe respond directly to the question, at least the part of what, what has the ABA authorized for the fall. Um, last week, Bill Adams came on a conference uh, that was put on by Drexel, and he was very clear about the ABA's position and um, that they understand that law schools need to start planning for the fall semester and that there is value to asynchronous learning. And so the ABA, I believe, already met with deans this past Friday, where they explained that they're putting together a, um, a very simple, I think it was only 11 question variant application uh, that they are prepared to grant to any law school that needs to go beyond the uh, limited or, or the, um, sorry, the distance ed limits uh, placed by the ABA. So um, from what I heard from that and from emails that I've seen from Bill to deans, I, I don't get that impression at all. I think the ABA sees value in distance education and asynchronous education, uh, and they understand what law schools are facing at the time at this time. Uh, just to, if I can just throw something out here, John, just quickly. Um, Steve, go would, ahead. Thanks. I would just add that not all students will show up and be ready to learn at an appointed time. Um, that's the linearity we had in law school. And so some of them actually circadian rhythm show, some of them are larks and really good in the morning. Some are owls, really good at night. And if we want them to learn better, we actually should have more flexible learning. And that's really that mobile learning concept that we often don't have. And one thing I would say about asynchronous and why it's so valuable, even in person, I've been told by students, I've started now asking the questions I wanted to ask in class in advance. Here are the 10 questions I'm gonna ask about this case. They love that because now they can organize it, put it together, understand a lot more about it than in class. And I actually am somewhat Socratic in class. I will have conversations. But now I realize that alone, this is called a meal. We need an appetizer. We need main course and dessert. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with having multiple forms of learning. The neuroscience supports it. Allie, were you uh, trying to speak? Yeah, I was just going to say on the, the ABA, um, Standard 316, which deals with credit hours and the amount of time that we have to engage with our students, uh, was changed a few years ago from only focusing on classroom hours to also including more direct faculty instruction. And so everything that we've been talking about fits within that direct faculty instruction. So even if we're not in an emergency situation, there is flexibility and acknowledgement on the part of the ABA that not everything has to be done from the teacher to the student in the classroom. Um, and as long as you can you can demonstrate that it is direct faculty instruction, that they're meeting the, the learning outcomes. Um, the ABA is, has gotten uh, more broad in terms of what they're willing to accept in that regard. Yeah, and I was gonna say that, that, that this might be moot uh, in the sense that if, uh, if the faculty member is uh, immunocompromised or taking care of people who are such, or the students are or something, uh, all the pronouncements about wanting to teach face-to-face -face may be 
uh, you know, crazy in, in light of a second spike or a third spike in, in the pandemic. We are still in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and, and preparing to teach online, which is hard work and, uh, and, uh, and, and as Jennifer talked about, uh, will will yield the, the option to do whatever you want and, and in much the same way that you want to have multiple tools in your tool belt for, for whatever the scenarios uh, play out. Um, I wanted to jump to a question at the bottom because I think it's like a really, a really important one. Um, how can we foster students seeking help when we are online? Like, you know, how to connect with academic support, diversity professionals, deans of students, you know, being online means, means less access to them. What, 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 how do you, how do you signal to the students that they, that they've, how do you reach through the screen to pull them, pull them back uh, in these situations? Melissa, unmute yourself. Um. I think it's a little bit, um, both being a director of academic success, as well as um, having the weekend program where they, even when they're on campus, it's so jam-packed with classes that they don't have a lot of time for that external support, um, like academic support, career services, stuff like that. Um, and what I've done, and this may be an unpopular opinion, I have just made myself very available. My students have my cell phone and email and they know that they can Zoom me. I know not everyone likes to give out the cell phone. I have not had any students abuse it. I've been lucky. There may come a day when my luck changes, um, but I, I've had great success because then they feel that they can text me and if I'm available, maybe I'll give them a call, even if we can't set up a, a Zoom chat. Um, and especially when I'm dealing with bar students that are panicking with the bar moving all all around. Um, I think that that helps make them feel like there's someone that's going to listen. Um, and then unofficially, I think some people have mentioned like message boards and stuff. Um, I use some like academic, I have like a twin that's designed just for academic support and bar and stuff and keep the conversations going on that. I routinely email them um, at least once a week. We said earlier that Brittany was in this, she was signed up, so I have to kind of give her a shout out. She gave me the idea very recently to do Monday motivations. So her students know every Monday, she's gonna be emailing them with a little motivation. And um, I've been trying to do similar things to that. And also having Zoom office hours, which I think we all do. But I literally, like earlier today, I sat there on Zoom and let people pop in and out. Um, and, and I think it, it's not necessarily 100% ideal, but I, I do think it's working. Very good, very good. All right, well, how about one more question? Um, this is a good one. What criteria do you use to determine if the content or if the learning should be delivered in either asynchronous or synchronous in Zoom or in a, in a socially distanced classroom, if that's, if that's your option? So if you had your druthers, you know, what would you pick, or how do you how do you pick where 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 to go? Yeah. So I'll, I'll jump in on that question. Um, I, I because so I I chose the flipped classroom model because in some ways I've already made a decision about that question. Um, so I view the information sharing, quite honestly, as the least important part of my job, right? Because with the amount of information that's out there at this point honestly they could find information and so i i do i do not prioritize that that's what i put into my um, asynchronous component that's the videos i still try to keep them engaged by embedding the questions but that's not what i prioritize so what those activities that i do consider to be the priority that's what's happening in the classroom that's where i'm giving them an opportunity to apply the lessons to work through problems to help them think through and be there to give them feedback. Those are the things that they could not get otherwise. Um, so that's how I make my decision. What are those things that they can get anywhere? Then I don't prior prioritize that. What they really need from me, that's what I do in the classroom or real time face to face, even if it's uh, online. Beautifully said. <laughs> Wonderful. I almost don't know. I almost want to stop at that point and, and just and just say, you know, let, let pause for a moment. Don't use the classroom as an information transfer system. It's a terrible way to do it. Students are pull, will pull information more easily than you push it at them. At least that's what I believe. Um, uh, all right, one more question. Um, uh, first of all, Steve, lots of people wanting links. So please post links and your, your slides uh, to, to, to your 
for uh, up on your 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 session. Um, uh, John, those the, those are already posted. Awesome. Yeah. Um, how much should we be planning on spring 2020 COVID conditions for fall 2020? Uh, for example, I gave my students great leeway uh, with with who didn't have good internet, but you know I hope they have, that they have that solved by fall 2020. Yeah, I, I, what, what's your call? Students aren't in charge of that. Um, internet companies are in charge of that. And it, it, to a certain extent, right? So we can't have unreasonable expectations. I've had internet problems when I've been at home. Melissa was on with us earlier. We did a pre, a pre test before we jumped on and she was having internet problems. We can't have expectations that our students are going to erect towers in, in their backyards to ensure that they have internet access. And, and we have to understand a lot of that's not in their control. But it also has to do with how many other people are gonna be in their home doing the same thing. And, and we have to recognize that they're gonna be competing for all of the resources, the space, um, all of the things with whoever else they live with as well. That hasn't changed if it's spring or if it's fall. Um, and, and, and it's not changing for us either. So I think we, we have to remember all of the things, the frustrations that we've experienced in teaching are the same frustrations that our students are going to be facing um, as well. Um, and, and recognize, you know, yes, do they have the time to purchase a printer, which has been one of the things people have really stressed over. Obviously, they can plan for having a printer. They can plan for having um, a camera or things like that. Although I'm still going to be really careful about forcing a student to be on camera with me because sometimes they live in circumstances that they aren't comfortable. They don't feel safe exposing everything about what's around them um, and, and things like that. Or they're, maybe they're trying to protect the identity and the privacy of their child who's running around naked behind them, you know, that they can't really fully control. Um, and so so, you know, I'll, in, I'll tell students, I think it's great if they have the ability to be on camera. Um, I'll find alternative ways to engage with students one on one to make sure that I know that that things are okay and that they're connecting with with what we're doing. Um, but I'm also going to tell them, hey, just let me know if there's a reason why you can't you can't be doing this in this format in the way that I'd like you to, uh, because I don't want to be unreasonable. John, I found a big difference between my spring and summer sessions where I had more students in the spring that didn't have microphones and cameras. And by summertime, a lot of that happened where they actually, most of them have a camera now mm -hmm. and an ability to participate. Um, and the number of even the tech, the internet problems seem to have gone down. I do have one or two students in the summer class that seem to still have some of the 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 tech issues and every and every and all of them every once in a while have their internet slow today kind of thing um and that they can't help um interestingly enough i do tell them hey you know, when i call on you if i if i say um susan are you here um you know i ask them to turn their video on for that if it's your time to present in class and i haven't had anyone who said they don't want to present they just turn on their their, um, they turn on their camera just for, for that portion if they don't have it on. Mm -hmm. And I have a number of students who are doing like we are here. They have a nice um, Zoom background. And so they're trying to make the best of the world that they're in. Um, but I do, I would hope maybe um, the better that we, that we also get with this, the students are getting better at this too. Um, what accessing um, uh, the things that we make available for them and participating um, in these, whether it's the synchronous or the asynchronous. So my suspicion is we're going to continue to see them get better at it as well. Excellent. All right. I'm going to call it. That's that. That's that's our session, folks. Um, thank you to all the speakers. That was that was a wonderful discussion. Um, of course, it's been recorded. Uh, get your slides up if you haven't already. I understand most of you have. Um, so we're we're gonna break. Um, the 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 happy hour starts in I don't know. Give us give us seven minutes or so. You know, uh, there's a there's a link on the on the on the uh, uh, that's been sent out, um, and we'll take it from there. Bye, folks. <laughs>